family and I are working through the adjustment period. And that's really what this adjustment, that's really what the last year has been, is been an adjustment of what capabilities do I have? What capabilities do I not have? Uh, and then as they came back or didn't come back, what those new abilities allowed me to do. Uh, so my, I, I don't think that that's normal for any child. So my children have had to work through that as they have navigated this last six to eight months, which has been a pretty tumultuous time. And then my wife has had to navigate uh, both what I can do and how she can challenge me and allow me, give me room to grow uh, without being uh, demanding too much of me or demand, not demanding enough of me. So there's a, there's a balance there. And we've had to wrestle through that as a family. So, uh, yeah, I've had <laughs> some counting the night that I went to the hospital. My very first operation was, I believe five to eight hours, five, five hours long. Um, I think it was five hours long. The and that operation included a vascular surgeon who repaired my carotid and jugular, uh, a ears, nose, ENT, so ear, nor ear, nose, and throat specialist surgeon who repaired my uh, trachea and my whole throat. Um, a, they consulted with a brain surgeon regarding the pellets that were in my brain. Uh, and then just a general trauma surgeon for all the other issues. Uh, there was another procedure when one of the pellets broke free of my stomach and I started bleeding during ICU. During my ICU stay, I started bleeding internally. Uh, that wasn't technically a procedure, but uh, I get, <laughs> basically it's like a spray foam insulation. Uh, but it's tissue safe or bio safe. So they patched that hole up. Uh, and that was most of what I had in the hospital. Post hospital, my speech was really jacked up. My left vocal cord was still paralyzed uh, from all the trauma. And I had a implant uh, performed, which is this, uh, I have a big scar that runs from uh, up high to down low and terminate somewhere down low. And then there's a short one that runs across my throat where they did an implant that supplements my um, speech so that, that my speech is about as clear as it's going to be. The interview that I gave early, early on, um, what I think it was a six month mark, I highlighted how overwhelming it was to be on the receiving end of so much uh, support. Uh, the support included from start to finish, Portland was just continually and has been continually overwhelming in their support. Uh, both Portland Police as an agency in Portland, CERT, their SWAT team, coming alongside my family, coming alongside my teammates, and just coming alongside me uh, we were building a house, a dare construction, a dare home builders. Uh, I, I had agreed to do a lot of work around the house, which during the home build and was not going to be able to do that. And a dare stepped in and took over some of that. Uh, it, family and friends came and, and coworkers signed up and did a bunch of painting, helped move my family. Uh, we're coming up on the one year mark. So I'm reviewing a lot of the stuff that I've been through. And one of the things that I, I forget is because there's so much going on, you can't keep track of it all. Uh, and one of the things that I was reminded of was I had to relearn to walk. I literally did not know how to walk. I uh, could not walk and was excited when I had taken a hundred steps or walked a hundred yards. That, that was exciting. Uh, which is a sad place to be. And from that place, 
uh, I was unable to move my family into the house that we built. I was unable to do painting. I was unable to build a porch that needed to be built. Uh, I was unable to do a drain behind the house uh, that needed to be put in. And Green, I think it's David Green Construction, uh, Adair Home Builders, uh, Rodney Moore with uh, Moore Construction. Just a hundred people, at least a hundred people has come along, have come alongside my family from everything from meals to emotional support, uh, trying to uh, educate us on the fi family dynamics of ICU and trauma. Uh, there's just overwhelming. I could go on for probably a half hour and not even begin to scratch the surface for the amount of support and love we've had from the community and from my coworkers. The coworkers, my coworkers, Awesome. And I, I can't begin to know, I can't begin to explain to the community of Washington County and Oregon um, the type of people that I serve next to. And we do honestly serve. The people that I work with serve Washington County. And we don't work for Washington County, the agency. We serve the community of Washington County and the people that are in Washington County. And uh, the support has been overwhelming from the community. And, and I think that that's just a matter of who Washington County is as a, a group of people. Uh, there has been a, a cascade of support from the people specifically directed at the agency and then indirectly or periodically uh, something will be directed to me that the agency received uh, some well wish or card or a note of appreciation that has come through. And uh, that kind of support is, it's important that the sacrifice that I made wasn't just for my coworkers, the, the sacrifice that I'd made and the injury that I sustained as a result of the work that I do was for the community. And to know that my community appreciates the work that we do, regardless of whether or not we're, we've been injured is, is important. And it makes me happy that I work in such an awesome agency, in such an awesome community. So to answer the question specifically, uh, just continue to appreciate and show your appreciation for Washington County. We, we feel it and we know it and it, it really makes easier for us to be at work. Um, my coworkers have come alongside me and they love to, <laughs> they've been very patient with me in my uh, return to work. They've been very patient with me uh, in me telling my story and um, they've been excited to tell me their story of what their experience was on that day. And that's, it's touching to me. It's uh, important that I, it's important to me that people know their story is important. Uh, my, my experience did not happen in a vacuum. It, did, it was not a, a standalone experience. My experience impacted other people. And it's awesome to hear those stories. So just continue to tell those stories. So I returned to work on June 1. And <laughs> which is fun for me because I got to work, I returned to work less than 10 months after the injury, a pretty horrific injury. Um, so I was back to work with in, with in under 10 months, uh, but there's still a lot of physical therapy before I get back to work full time. So that, what do I do while I'm at work? Uh, lots of training. Washington County is a very professional organization, which means that we have a lot of policies that cover a lot of things. And I've been reviewing lots of policies. I've been taking online classes. Uh, so our SWAT team takes uh, pride, even before this event, <laughs> in the medical first aid, uh, tactical emergency medical care. 
and uh, there's a new class that I need to take and I have been taking uh, lots of policies to review lots of uh, new systems to learn and then I've also been testing for sergeant which well, you guys know the results of that I think after you go through something like this you realize that your motivations there is no for me there was no singular motivation uh, just prior to the uh, assault that caused me to be this severely injured I'd gone camping with my family and had played with my my son is huge uh, my oldest son is at that time was 510 160 pounds and I was able to stand up from underwater and hold him uh, in a position where he was standing on my my hands and I, I had come from underwater from a, basically a sitting position in the pool to a standing position and I was able to hold him uh, while he stood up above me and uh, we had been down at uh, Lincoln City and I don't know if you guys have ever been to Lincoln City there's a huge dune on the north end of the beach and I climbed that dune and part of my motivation was I want to be able to do things like that with my kids I don't have a lot of time left with my kids as children so I want to be able to enjoy their childhood and have me enjoy their childhood with them. Uh, so that was part of the motivation. Part of, the other part of the motivation is I refuse to let the man who shot me to determine my fate. My fate is in hands much greater and more solid and more affirming and loving than his. And, uh, I refuse to let him determine my ability to go back to work. And then there's the motivation to serve my team. And my team is both patrol and the SWAT team. And uh, I feel a certain obligation, and not a cheap obligation, but a, 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 high, a higher calling to return as good as I can. And that I owe that to them for the the life that they saved on the hill that day. And it's the least that I can do to honor the risks that they took and the sacrifices they made to get me off that hill safely. <laughs> the advice that I would give people that are about to go through a situation like this or an experience like this is don't. Uh, but if you don't have a choice in that matter, you need to make sure that you're living a life that is full. Because so much of what spurs you on is the people that you've surrounded yourself with. Uh, you have to have some anchor behind the veil something that allows you to understand that life is more than this mean little experience that we have on this rock. To be quite frankly, the, one of my biggest motivations in returning has been my personal faith. And if you don't have a personal faith in something that's greater than this, or greater than you, greater than the people that are around you, then uh, it's going to be a tough, tough, it's a tough road anyway. So if you don't have a personal faith in something bigger than that and bigger than you and bigger than your family, man, that's, that's going to be tough. And I know that there were people around the world praying for me. And I know that because I was, I heard a story of a pastor in Taiwan, um, who called or emailed somebody in Africa and said, Hey, there's this cop named Jeremy Braun that you need to pray for. And the pastor in Africa said, Oh, don't worry. We've already got him on our list. So to know that there's people praying for you 
and a, a bigger community that's fighting for you and pulling for you is huge. And that you can't build that resource. You can't build that network after you're injured. You have to be working on that beforehand. And it's not a network that you ever plan on falling back on. And that's not the, the reason that I, I talked to the people that I talked to or interacted with the people I interacted with. But inevitably, that's what it becomes, is, because, is that people will remember who you are. People will remember who the people that you've uh, affected. And they will remember how you, you've treated them. And that's important. And you, can't, you don't get to go back and do that after the fact. You need to be doing the best that you can do beforehand and talking to people the way that you should be talking to people beforehand and saying the words that you should be saying beforehand. So, and you don't get to pick whether or not you're gonna go through one of these experiences. So, we should all be doing that. We should all be living life with the higher ideal and striving to impact people as positively as we can. The, the thing that I wrestle with most regarding the last year is the three points on a, on a line, where I was before the shooting, where I was after the shooting and where I am now. And the, the things that affect me are the differences between the beginning and the, the end, where I was and how far I regressed. I mean, it's, it's humbling to, at 43, learn how to eat, learn how to swallow your food, learn how to walk, have somebody hold you while you use the bathroom, hold, like keep you from stand, falling over, uh, have somebody bathe you because you can't take care of yourself, to, be, to go from walking and running and literally 15, you know, the 45 minutes or an hour and a half before the shooting, I'd been running uh, and strong. And that night I was bedridden and I was bedridden for the next few months, for the next month. It just barely learned to walk by the end of the, that month. So the difference between the, where I had been before the shooting and where I was at the end of my hospital stay was humbling. Uh, and it's, it's depressing to know how quickly those two events happen. I've improved a lot since, since the, since the recovery or since the shooting or since the, my release from the hospital to, to where I'm at now is, uh, miraculous. I, I have, uh, I, I, I cannot grasp how quickly I've been able to, uh, miraculously recover and it's not been a miracle alone but there's been a lot of hard work and a lot of like a lot of hard work and the people that work in the physical therapy that, is, that have treated me for physical therapy they've not been kind and I appreciate it they've pushed me beyond what I, where I would normally want to go so I appreciate that. Uh, but I, there's still so far to go. That last little bit, the difference between where I'm at and where I need to be is, for me, still depressing. Because it's been a year, and I, I've been working on it for a year. And to know that I still have a lot further to go, and I'm not getting any younger, uh, that's humbling. And it makes me sometimes doubt my ability to come back and then spurs me on to push harder. So that, that's what the last, really the last few months of the last year have been. Um, I starting to re remember more and contemplate more of uh, looking at photos of me learning to walk and just being surrounded by medical staff, uh, me celebrating uh, walking well, while held up by a, a brace that keeps you from falling. 
I mean, those are, at the time, they were photos of joy and like, okay, I can do this. But to look back, it's just so depressing to see how broken this body became very quickly. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, future forward, the, my hope is, so I just talked to my doctor today and, uh, sounds like I will be going back to work. So I've been back to work Monday, Wednesday, Friday, half days, uh, with a day of rest in between, uh, I'll starting soon. I don't know when I'll be going back to work Monday, Wednesday, Friday, full eight hour days, uh, just to keep pushing and keep growing. That's the next challenge is to work a full 40 hour week, uh, and to continue to work on my rehab, which is, has always been difficult for me. So, uh, to, to balance the, the workouts and the, and the work, uh, it will help being at the training center and not working the road. But ultimately my goal, I'm hoping to be back on the road this year, uh, 2020. Uh, but that, a lot of that just depends on my abilities and uh, like, I can't, you don't know what you can't, what you can and can't do until you try to try it. Right. So, uh, I will continue to expand my horizons and expand my, uh, work hours and what I'm pushed to do. And then I will either eventually reach where I need to be or not reach where I need to be and decisions will have to be made either way. So hope to be back working with the SWAT team at the end of the, by the end of this year as well.